Hello, my name is uh, Angela Dispensieri and I am uh, a doctor at the Mayo Clinic. I'm a hematologist, a professor of medicine and laboratory medicine. And today I'd like to talk to you about AL amyloidosis treatment, including high dose chemotherapy with stem cell transplantation. So uh, just a very brief introduction about what um, AL amyloidosis is. It's one of um, many different types of amyloidosis. And here you can see a list of a number of different types of, of amyloidosis. Um, amyloid is a disease where um, different proteins, for whatever reason, and we don't always understand it very well, um, decide to basically um, group together in what we call amyloid fibrils. Um, AL, uh, the building block protein or precursor protein is made of immunoglobulin, most commonly immunoglobulin light chain. And this is a disease that can affect uh, the heart, the kidney, the liver, the nerves, the skin, soft tissues. Um, you can see that there are a number of other types of amyloids, which are very different diseases, but um, they share in common that they have these fibrils, which under the microscope um, are perceived as what we call amyloid. Um, the bulk of the diseases that I have listed there are actually hereditary forms. The good news is that AL is not a hereditary form of amyloid. It's something that's acquired, and if a person has it, it's not something that they should worry about, that um, their family members are going to be affected. Um, so we're going to move on now uh, to what this is. And so here's a cartoon of a person, uh, and you can see a blow up that um, there's bone marrow. Uh, so that's a shot of part of the pelvis uh, where a lot of bone marrow is. And so AL is actually a, a bone marrow disease. Um, in the bone marrow, there are a number of different types of cells. Uh, plasma cells are cells that we all have. Um, they're actually immune cells. They help us fight off infection. Uh, and that's what happens in health. Um, and the job of these plasma cells is they make these um, proteins that are represented by kind of those Ys that you can see on the slides. Those are called antibodies or immunoglobulins. And again, in health, these are really important and uh, they protect us. Um, these immunoglobulins can be uh, intact so that they're kind of made of four pieces, um, two smaller pieces which are called light chains and two heavier pieces which are called heavy chains. Um, you can also see uh, on the slide that those smaller pieces can sort of move off on their own and we call those free light chains. Um, so. Um, in some people, for reasons that we don't fully understand, there can be this overgrowth of these plasma cells in the bone marrow. And because these are the manufacturing sites of these immunoglobulins, and most importantly, these free light chains, if you have many more manufacturing plants, you end up with more of that product, these free light chains that can be circulating in the bloodstream. And in patients who have this tendency towards amyloidosis, these free light chains can sort of line up into these little fibrils or, 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 or almost think of fibers um, that then can deposit in the various tissues. Um, AL likes to uh, infiltrate or um, deposit in the heart and the kidneys most commonly. It also uh, can sometimes deposit in the liver or the nerves. It can deposit in the skin and the soft tissue ligaments. And again, this putting this, this protein, this gunky stuff, uh, in places it doesn't belong can actually make people feel unwell and of course um, threaten their quality of life and, and their lifespan. So what do we do about this? How does one treat AL amyloidosis? So the strategies are sort of really two major categories. One is kill those plasma cells. So I showed you those plasma cells that reside in the bone marrow. If we could wipe those out, um, then we can't make any more of those uh, immunoglobulins and, and hopefully life would be good. 
Another approach would be to pull amyloid from the tissues. I said to you that the amyloid uh, is sort of mucking up the works. And so if we had uh, an amyloid vacuum cleaner, some way of actually pulling it out of the tissues, that would be wonderful. In current day, um, there isn't uh, uh, any types of drugs that really work to do that, that we know of. But the good news is that there are several drugs, uh, experimental drugs and clinical trials whose goal is to actually, or mechanism of action, is to, to really draw that amyloid from, from the tissues. So more to follow on that. But Again, our major path outside of clinical trials, experimental clinical trials, is to kill those plasma cells. So how do we do that? Well, we use a combination of drugs, chemotherapies actually, and um, the, one of the most common combinations is the combination of something called bortezomib, dexamethasone, and cyclophosphamide. Sometimes uh, cyclophosphamide is replaced by a drug called melphalan. Um, there are other medications like pomalidomide and lenalidomide that are used and often combined with dexamethasone. Um, there are other drugs that are used for m multiple myeloma. Now, amyloid is a cousin disease to multiple myeloma. Uh, both are diseases where there's a overgrowth of these plasma cells in the bone marrow. So myeloma is about five times more common than AL amyloidosis. And so we can um, uh, sort of uh, borrow from their armamentarium. And as drugs are developed for multiple myeloma, we can try to see if we can use them in patients with, um, with AL amyloid. Um, we know that often uh, these drugs are, have more side effects in patients with AL than they do with multiple myeloma. So we don't always just take uh, a myeloma drug and just throw it uh, in the direction of an AL patient. And we mix and match, and so there's a lot of different combinations, which I'm not listing right here, um, but we can uh, swap drugs around to try to make that uh, work for us. Um, there are a number of uh, really interesting uh, drugs that are in clinical trials for myeloma that we're starting to try in patients with AL amyloid. Uh, one of them is called uh, venetoclax, another is called daratumumab, uh, et cetera. So that list will hopefully grow and grow so we can um, be very effective effective at um, treating uh, patients with AL. Another therapy that we use is high-dose melphalan with stem cell transplant or stem cell transplant or um, some call it bone marrow transplant or autologous stem cell transplant, which is another way of killing plasma cells. So each and every one of those um, dots that I have listed under killing plasma cells, they all have the exact same goal get rid of those plasma cells so they can't make any more of those bad immunoglobulins, those bad light chains, and then allow the body to, number one, not get worse, and number two, to actually heal faster. So the body knows that amyloid doesn't belong in the tissues. Um, it's just not very effective at drawing it out itself. It does it, but it does it very slowly. And the, the metaphor I like to use is that if you imagine that you have a thousand guys laying bricks to build a wall, and there's one poor soul at the back trying to take that wall down, um, he's not gonna do very well, right? The thousand guys are just gonna keep laying brick after brick after brick, and that wall is gonna get bigger and bigger. So that amyloid is gonna get worse and worse. However, if you can kind of get rid of those thousand guys, make them go away, then that guy at the back of the line, which is actually your body or a patient's body trying to heal, then that, that sole um, individual, so to speak, can actually pick away and get rid of the amyloid and, and then that will um, reduce the amyloid burden in the body and make a patient better. And so the question is, what is high-dose uh, chemotherapy with stem cell transplant? Uh, it's basically, um, just like the chemotherapy I mentioned, um, the other chemotherapies I mentioned, it's trying to get rid of those plasma cells. And so it's kind of the mother of all chemotherapies in that it basically is um, very high doses of a drug um, called melphalan that are given to a patient. Now, if we give those very high doses of chemotherapy, we know that we can kill 
probably more plasma cells than a lot of the other drugs that I already listed to you. That may change over time, however. Some of our drugs may be as effective as using really high doses of melphalan. That's a work in progress. But if, I were, if a, a physician were to give very high doses of chemotherapy, high doses of melphalan to a patient, they would kill a lot of plasma cells in the vast majority of patients. However, there would be collateral damage. Those other bone marrow cells that, it, uh, that are normal cells that we all rely on uh, to help us fight infection or to uh, give us clotting cells called platelets or to help us carry oxygen with our red blood cells, those would be irreparably damaged and uh, we wouldn't be able to make those things anymore. So that would be a bad thing. So somebody came up with the ideas, can we have the best of both worlds? Can we perhaps um, basically uh, give the high dose chemotherapy but give seed cells back to the patient so that they can regrow the good stuff, that they, they can regrow um, those uh, normal uh, red cells and platelets and, and other important white cells. Uh, and so that's what that was the birth of stem cell transplant. And so the mechanism by which we do this high dose chemotherapy is first we need to get the seed cells from the patient uh, ahead of time. And so we can collect those seeds um, through a tricky process called stem cell collection. Uh, we can basically give some shots uh, that uh, um, uh, coax uh, bone marrow seed cells into the blood cells, so good seed cells into the um, bloodstream. And then we can do a procedure called leukophoresis that basically um, we can uh, just with a session where a patient just lays in a chair or bed for about five hours, we can sort of skim off um, the seed cells and then collect those and put them in the freezer so they're ready to go for the patient when they need them. And then what we do is we give those very high doses of chemotherapy through the, the vein, uh, and then when the chemotherapy has left the body, which is usually about 24 hours or less, uh, we can actually give those seed cells back. Uh, and what happens is those seed cells are given through the bloodstream, they home in to the bone marrow and start growing. So we're trying here again to get the best of both worlds. We're giving really high doses of chemotherapy um, to get rid of as many plasma cells as possible. And then we're regenerating our bone marrow so that we don't have um, a transfusion need ongoing. Um, during the course of two to three weeks while a patient is sick from the chemotherapy and before the seed cells have grown back in, people will need transfusions and antibiotics and other types of supportive care. Um, but once they've gotten through that, then uh, basically we look to see have we um, achieved our goals and reduced the number of plasma cells, reduced the number of light chains, uh, and then hopefully set the patient on their road to recovery. And so again, whether it's a stem cell transplant or whether it's other types of chemotherapy, the approach is the same. The approach is to get rid of the plasma cells, get rid of the light chains that can make the amyloid. Now, the other piece that I mentioned uh, that I didn't mention yet is that the amyloid fibrils that get into the organs can be toxic, but those free light chains that have the ability to turn into amyloid also can be toxic in their own right. And so each of these approaches that I've talked to you, again, are doing the same thing, getting rid of the plasma cells, getting rid of the light chains, and hopefully getting rid of the amyloid so that they're, over a period of time, can be healing. So people often ask, you know, which therapy is best? And there's a question as to whether the transplant itself is the best therapy. And that's a really hard question to answer because, um, really often the healthiest patients are the ones that are offered the transplant because giving those very high doses of chemotherapy not only affect the bone marrow, you know, the normal bone marrow elements that I told you could be a bad thing, and that's why we have to give those seeds back, um, but it can also um, be toxic or poisonous to other organs. Um, it can make people very sick to their stomach, and it puts a real strain on the system. And if a patient with AL amyloidosis 
diagnosis is already rather sick from the disease, that their heart doesn't work very well or their liver or kidneys don't work very well, then they can get into trouble and the transplant can be life-threatening and uh, patients can even die related to the procedure. And so we have to be very cautious in how we select the patients that move to the transplant. In turn, the results of transplant um, typically will look a little better overall um, than the uh, treatments that we use in patients who we don't offer transplant to because the sicker patients uh, are not typically offered the stem cell transplant and the healthier patients are. And intuitively, healthy patients tend to do better than sicker patients, and so that can skew those results. Um, as our treatments improve uh, to kill plasma cells with all these new medications that I've already mentioned, drugs like bortezomib and some of these other drugs that are up and coming uh, that we're using for myeloma, it may well be that transplant won't even uh, be necessary, that these other drugs will achieve the same end, that they will kill plasma cells well and, and durably. Unfortunately, these therapies um, don't work for everybody. Even transplant doesn't work for everybody. But we have a lot of other options. As I showed you, we can try plan A, plan B, et cetera. And hopefully, we can uh, improve patients, not only their quality of life, um, but also their longevity. And we certainly have done that over the course of the past decades with patients living two, three, four, five times as long as they had um, historically. And so um, we're very excited about the progress that we're making, but uh, we still have a, a long way to go. And um, through collaboration and um, centers of um, excellence like the Mayo Clinic, um, advances can be made. And, and hopefully um, there will be uh, more and more patients that derive benefit and derive benefit more easily uh, without uh, so many side effects. Uh, and that they can uh, live um, long, healthy lives. Um, there are a few must-dos if somebody's diagnosed with amyloid, and I just want to run through these briefly. Um, the important part is that a patient must establish the type or the building blocks of the amyloidosis. On one of the first slides I showed you, I pointed out that there are different building blocks, and the, the chemotherapies I just told you about only are used for the AL type. You have to understand which of your organs are most at risk. Um, you have to consult with an amyloidosis specialist to design a plan for you. This is important because it's a very rare disease, eight in a million per year. And so um, one needs to understand this disease in order to offer the best supportive care and the best therapeutic plan. And then learn which parameters are most important to follow your disease. The light chains are typically among the most important things to follow, but there are other blood markers, be it uh, um, chemicals in the blood like nt proben p or troponin, uh, uh, alkaline phosphatase, uh, serum albumin, creatinine, uh, urine total protein, et cetera, to follow. And one must maintain hope. There, as I mentioned, there's been a lot of progress in this disease. It's important to take good care of yourself in other ways, good diet and exercise regime. And finally, maintain a good support network. And with that, I would like to thank you for your time and attention.